Hello, everyone, and welcome to Season 2, Episode 11 of the Historian's Lounge here on Tales from the Wandering Scribe. I'm your host, Gabriel Garcia, otherwise known as the Wandering Quill and the Wandering Scribe. And today we have a returning guest making their second appearance and official debut here in the Historian's Lounge series. Now, if you remember my guest, he is a professor of history and coordinator of the Global Studies Program at Delaware County Community College in Medea, Pennsylvania. He holds history and global studies degrees from Asil University, Via Nova University, and the University of Pennsylvania. And his publication topics include the U.S. Army's 1916 punitive expedition into Mexico, tactical development in the U.S. Army during the Great War, and Cold War diplomacy. And for today's episode, we'll be talking about one of those publication topics, specifically the U.S. Army's 1916 punitive expedition into Mexico. And to tell us all about that and more and the legacy and history behind it, let's give a huge round of applause to returning guest, Professor Jeffrey Lamonica. Lamonica, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's good to be with you again, Gabriel. Awesome. So just as a little recap, uh, would you like to share with our viewers and listeners, what you've been up to since the last time you were on the show? Well, uh, let's see. Last time I was with you, uh, it was, I believe, uh, July. Uh, we were uh, wrapping up with, uh, or j actually just beginning our, uh, our summer two semester right. uh, here at the college. And um, yeah, so since then, I have, uh, you know, we're well into our uh, fall semester here. Um, hoping to wrap that up smoothly in the next couple of weeks and um, had an opportunity to uh, to uh, to teach a uh, an adult education course at one of our local libraries uh, here in Ooh. Delaware. And we uh, we focused on uh, a couple of different. It was a five week course. We did a couple of different topics uh, regarding the American Civil War. So that was a nice uh, change of pace for my uh, typical um, teaching routine at the college. I always enjoy uh, having an opportunity to uh, to do uh, adult education courses uh, over at the library whenever I can. Awesome. That's really, really great to hear. And I'm really excited to dive deep into the topic because you've actually written a book on this, which I don't think a lot of people know about this part in U.S. history. I mean, we know Generally speaking, the general public knows of who Pancho Villa was and what he did in the United States. But other than that, there's not a lot of scholarship or people look into the scholarship. So, uh, Professor Lamonica, can you give us a little overview of pretty much what your your book is that you've uh, worked on and what is important about the scholarship? Uh, yeah, I... Um... My uh, my 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 dissertation um, was about the United States Army and its uh, tactical development during World War One. And when I was researching for that project, uh, many times I, I came across references to this punitive expedition into Mexico in 1916. And um, it, it, it intrigued me um, immediately, but of course my task at hand at that particular point in time was to finish my dissertation, mm. which, which I, I, I ultimately did. And uh, it, it was uh, in it, it, it has been published and um, so that was a great experience, and um, it, it was a really uh, enjoyable project that I immersed myself in for many, many years. Um, and my intention was at some point in time to get back to um, looking at this 1916 expedition. And uh, I eventually did, and I started uh, doing research for the project. 
And when it uh, when it, when it came down to time for me to wrap up with uh, my research and actually begin writing, uh, that's when the pandemic hit. Mm. So essentially, this this book it was was my my pandemic uh, project. Ah, and, uh, and it it was uh, finally published in twenty twenty one, and uh, yeah. So I worked on this. Uh, through those uh those those pandemic days mm. um so yeah that's kind of how this project came to be i mean it, it, in a lot of ways it's an offshoot of my dissertation dealing with uh, the u.s army uh during the great war and uh and and this was uh, kind of a natural um uh, kind of a next step and so this uh this became a, a project of mine and um, yeah, uh, the, my my entire first chapter uh, of 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 this book, I deal with uh, the historiography, and I take a little bit of time to kind of look at what other scholars and historians have had to say uh, about this 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 episode. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I I and and I think you're right. I think. Uh, there isn't a, a, a ton uh, written about this topic, but there there is um, there is some significant work that has been done, mm -hmm. and I try to uh, you know give an overview and a synthesis of those works in um, in my in my introductory paragraph. So there is some there is some historiography there, and anyone who uh, reads my book will certainly be pointed toward uh, lots of other scholarship on the topic if they're interested. Excellent. So let's actually dive right into sort of like this period in U.S. military history and U.S. Uh, Mexican history in general. So my understanding of the U.S. Army's punitive expedition was this was at, you know, the height, and I could be wrong with my dates, is it around the height of the the Mexican Civil War between Ponce Villa and his uh, army against the Federales of the Mexican government. And of course, Ponce Villa needs to get weapons and armaments to supply his army. Of course, the only one that the only neighbor that's closest to them is, of course, the United States. So if I understand my history right, there were raids by Ponce Villa and his men to raid U.S. stockpiles and hop on trains, it's not like even raid uh, military trains, cargo trains to resupply their armed forces. And when does sort of like the U.S. really get involved? Because the U.S. didn't get involved in at least World War I for another two years. So this was their kind of, not a global conflict, but this was like a military action that needed to be dealt with. Well, you you know, you're, you're absolutely right. So this... Um... This is a very, very turbulent time uh, in the history of Mexico. Um, it started uh, in 1910 in Mexico um, with the uh, the collapse of the Diaz regime. And in the wake of that kind of revolutionary environment in Mexico, it eventually kind of degenerates into a mm. massive and complicated civil war. And that carried on for years. And one of the factions in, in this very complicated multi-faction civil war was, was Villa, uh, General Villa and uh, his Villistas, as, as, as they were called. And um, their success and 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 progress in in this mexican civil war um kind of ebbed and flowed in in 1916 uh it was uh via's um movement was at a low point mm. um he had suffered some military defeats which had cost caused his forces to dwindle in size so the vistas in 1916 were really down to 
um, just kind of an, uh, an irregular cavalry force. Uh, ah, okay. Which is in, in contrast to previous years where Villa was in command of a, of a much more conventional fighting force. Mm. Uh, but by at this time period, yeah, he was he was only in command of a, a relatively small band of irregular cavalry. And this was as a re, like I said, this was as a result of some of the hard times and military setbacks that he had suffered um, leading into 1916. So, yeah, he's in he's in a state of, of um, desperation in 1916. He brings. Um, his force into uh, the northern Mexican state of Chihuahua, which is was his 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 home state. So he brings his force north into um, friendly territory because that's where right. he was from. And he 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 begins to take steps to try to um, rebuild his fighting force, and part mm. of that was these these raids that you're referring to um where yeah he needed supplies uh he needed weapons he needed horses and uh and he needed money and so raiding um various different targets in northern mexico was kind of what he was doing uh in in as we move into 1916 and during this time period there were um, many, um, there were many American-owned businesses, um, railroads, right, and mines um, in in northern Me- Mexico. In in the previous two decades, the Mexican government invited a lot of U.S. investment. And so that resulted in a lot of ranches and mines and, and railroads in northern Mexico that were owned by um, wealthy Americans. And, right. and, and, and Villa targets these during his time uh, in, in going into 1916 in, in Chihuahua. Um, he, he raids railroads, he raids mines, he raids ranches. And he's attempting to try to rebuild and, and replenish his fighting force. And he's p- specifically a ta- targeting um, American businesses during this time period because the Wilson administration had just recently recognized the uh, rival, Carrasco, mm. uh, as the official government of Mexico. And this, this angered. Via via felt that you know the Civil War was not over yet, and uh, and until the Civil War was over, uh, the United States should uh, not recognize um, any faction until it was all said and done. And of course, Via him himself had, especially in previous years, had hoped that um, that he would establish the official government of Mexico and be recognized by the United States. As I said, he had suffered some setbacks. Um, and so at this particular point in time, leading into 1916, the United States uh, under President Wilson decided to recognize the Carranza regime as the official government of Mexico. And this infuriated Villa. Um, it meant that he would no longer be able to legally uh, purchase uh, uh, weapons and supplies from the United States. So mm. that since the United States, um, you know, kind of labeled him a bandit, uh, right? Which, which is certainly how uh, the Carranza regime in Mexico City viewed him, and this angered him. And so, in retaliation for this, um, he he targeted U.S. owned businesses and properties in northern Mexico, and ultimately um, decided to cross the border and raid. Uh, Columbus, New Mexico. Mm, fascinating. So before we dive into that, I think it's also important to bring the context of the Mexican Civil War, because I know a lot of people, uh, there's been, you know, some truth, some half truths, And I'm just curious, uh, 
uh, Professor, in your research, what have you uncovered as, you know, the, the causes of the Mexican Civil War in 1910 that brings about men like Pancho Villa and other revolutionaries? Yeah, well, the, the, that that's a um, it's a great question. It's a it's a huge question, a uh, complicated one, um, mm. and, and in, in many ways it it kind of goes beyond the scope of my particular book. Although I you know I do spend um, the beginning part of one of my chapters kind of explaining, well, how did we get to where we are? And yeah, to make a long story short, Mexico uh, for for a long time um, around the turn of the century had been ruled over by um, you know essentially a, a, an authoritarian dictator uh, mm. Diaz, and um, he is finally um, ousted in in 1910. But as a result of that, there were multiple factions vying for control of the Mexican government. And so you had Villa and his supporters coming out of northern Mexico. You had Zapata and his supporters coming out of southern Mexico. And you also had various different political and military leaders who were also trying to establish control over Mexico City. And as I said, this situation kind of ebbed and flowed. Um, For a moment there, it it did look like perhaps Villa would uh, succeed in the Civil War. He actually actually took control of Mexico City for a brief time. But when we fast forward to 1916, where my work picks up, He's uh, he's going through a tough time, mm. and, and 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 that's part of the reason why he is in such desperate need of resupply. Coupled with the other setback, which was more of a diplomatic setback, of the United States now recognizing the Carranza regime as the official government of Mexico. Fascinating, and see this period in history, I I love like the eras of what would lead to the Great War, even like the interwar periods was classified like, you know, even that's like 1920s, 1930s, but like before the Great War, there were conflicts all over the world. And this one was one of them that doesn't get a lot of scholarship. And I'm actually curious, uh, Professor, in your research, did you also touch on, if I'm not mistaken, there were also World War II leaders or future World War II leaders who actually got their start in not only World War One, but some also uh, gained experience um, of varying degrees during the 1916 <clears throat> punitive expedition. And I was wondering, what is their significance to the overall story? Well, <clears throat> one of the, um, I guess, traditional or, or, or kind of... Um, more popular notions about this punitive expedition in 1916 is that it somehow served as a um, as a dress rehearsal mm. for World War One for you know for the United States Army that right. participated in the expedition in 1916 and then of course in 1917 the United States Army is then sent over to participate in the Great War and so one of the more you know popular notions is is that this this expedition served as a as a quote dress rehearsal for world war one and um this is something that i explore quite a bit uh in my book uh in my introduction i spent some time looking at how other scholars and historians have perceived this as as a dress rehearsal and then in the conclusion is when I talk a little bit about um, my own thought, thoughts on on this being a dress rehearsal for World War One, and to make a long story short, I mean my conclusion is that we can look we can look at the punitive expedition as um, 
as a dress rehearsal for World War One. But with with we have to be very, very careful about it. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, only about 170,000 troops participated in the punitive expedition into Mexico. Um, about 10,000 went into Mexico and about another 160,000 mostly National Guard, were stationed along the border to um, prevent any further raids into the country. Right. When you think about that, I mean, that is only a, a, a very, 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 very small fraction of the millions of troops that we would be sending to Europe um, in 17 and 18. So I think that's that's something to consider. I mean, before we go ahead and confidently call this a dress rehearsal for World War One, we, we really need to take into consideration how the scope and scale of the punitive expedition, you know, pales in comparison to the American expeditionary forces that went over in World War One. So that's one kind of uh, thing that I would certainly caution in terms of uh, this being some kind of, um, you know, proving ground for for right. what we to do um, in 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 Europe, there's some other things to consider as well. Um, during the punitive expedition into Mexico, um, no artillery was was used in the punitive expedition. Mm. And, and, and I think maybe there was only one episode on the border where um, artillery was fired. And I believe that may have even happened after the punitive expedition. So that would be another thing that's very important to consider is that, yeah, you know, obviously we're going to make extended use of artillery in World War One. Right. And, no artillery is used in the punitive expedition. So I certainly that's another, you know, another example of how, yeah, we have to be careful when we call this a dress rehearsal for World War I, just because the scope and scale of it pales in comparison to the American expeditionary forces. But that being said, yes, you, you bring up a very important point. And that is that there were officers that were involved in the punitive expedition into Mexico, who did gain what I would certainly um, consider to be important experience leading troops into combat mm -hmm. um, and, and also dealing with some of the new um, um, complications of modern industrialized warfare. Right. And that would prove to be valuable experience for this small kind of core of officers who did manage to get some experience during the punitive expedition. And of course, one would be General Pershing. Mm -hmm. General Pershing uh, leads the, the expedition. He leads the 10,000 or so troops um, in, in, into Mexico. And um, certainly that gave him some um leadership experience at a, at a right um, but he also had to um, deal with things that I think would would give him um, some good experience for what he's going to have to take into consideration in, in, in great work for example wired communication definitely um, yeah this was a big um, this was a big issue when they went to Mexico, you know, maintaining wired communication. Um, and certainly they experienced their, um, their ups and downs with that. And I think that that provided some valuable uh, experience for, um, for the engineers uh, that were mm -hmm. serving over in Europe. Um, some of the, uh, the, the the automotive experience, uh, Pershing used trucks to create a, 
supply line into Mexico that stretched all the way back across the border to the United States. Um, obviously, trucks are going to come in very handy and, and play an extensive role um, during the Great War. Another individual who gains experience during the punitive ex expedition is General Patton. Yes. Um, yeah, well, he wasn't a general yet, but yeah, he's, uh, he's involved in the punitive expedition. He's one of Pershing's aides. Um, he does see some action. Uh, there's a very, uh, very dramatic episode hmm. where uh, he and a handful of, uh, of soldiers um, happen upon a ranch where uh, some of these um, subordinates are there and there's a bit of a shootout and some, uh, some um, of, of these um, important uh, kind of seconds in command are, are killed in that scrap. Um, now, of course, that's a very interesting episode. Right. Um, but at the extent to which that's going to help Patton when he's over in Europe, I mean, obviously that's highly debatable. But the fact that he's getting this experience uh, in the same way that Pershing was, you know, using automobiles um, for reconnaissance purposes, for supply purposes, um, learning the ups and downs of wired communication, you know, mm -hmm. really at that time, and it was very hard to maintain it. Uh, the use of aerial reconnaissance. Now, of course, you know, only a handful of airplanes went into Mexico to support Pershing's um, expedition, only a small handful. And most right. of them, most of them were out of commission within about a month for various different mechanical reasons and so forth. So, you know, we, we have to keep that in perspective. And obviously the AEF will be making use of hundreds of aircraft. Over right. In but it is a little bit of a way to kind of for the United States Army to get a little experience with the importance of aerial reconnaissance. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there is something to say in terms of the dress rehearsal theory, but we have to keep it in, in, in perspective in terms right. of, you know, the, the, the much, much, much smaller scope and scale of, um, of, of the punitive expedition. And the other thing that's important to remember as well is that the punitive expedition that actually went into Mexico was, these were, these were cavalry, you know, these were mounted mm. cavalry columns that were sent to pursue, um, a, a disperse, uh, perhaps capture Pancho Villa and his views. Right. And obviously that's very, very different from these massive infantry divisions that are going to be, you know, 28,000 troops strong, um, uh, you know, over on the Western front. And, right. And as, as you probably well know, you know, mounted cavalry, especially American mounted cavalry played almost no role at all in, 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 in World War One. So mm -hmm. I think it, it, it is, it's, it's, it's certainly, there's some validity to this dress rehearsal theory, um, but I think it also needs to be kept in, in, in perspective. And, and I, I'm not alone in this. Many of the other scholars and historians that I came across in doing my research and, and those that I try to address in my introduction, you know, also tend to, 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 to keep it in that perspective as well. Absolutely. And I'm glad you actually brought up um, patent too, because I remember in a documentary of the Titans of World War II it was on History Channel. It was literally the lead up of all these men during, like you know, the Punitive Expedition, the Great War, and World War II. And I remember there was a small piece on Patton, who, you know, according to this documentary, Patton was the one who recognized, you know, the advancements of mechanized warfare, industrial warfare. And mounting um, the Maxim machine guns or a variation of the Maxim machine gun onto a truck because it was faster than a horse. You could shoot accurately at that time. So it is fascinating how, yes, in a way, it is a not a rehearsal, but almost like a testing ground for new technology in this punitive expedition. And I'm actually glad you brought up the cavalry to the US cavalry because. When we think of cavalry troops, it's still a 
interesting discussion of, you know, a feudal style of warfare still existing as long as it did into the modern era, which is, you know, very, very fascinating. So the 10,000 troops go into Mexico. I imagine they had permission by the government to come in and operate, or maybe they were under the orders of the uh, U.S. government who told them, saying, do what you have to do, but don't start a war with the Mexican government. So what was sort of the end goals for both parties, for Pancho Villa and his forces, and the United States government, because it seems like the United States government was to capture Pancho Villa and either take him to the state or deliver him to the Mexican government, which may almost certainly lead to his death. So where did, what did your research uncover of that aspect of the expedition in 1916? Yeah. Um, judging uh, the success or failure uh, of this expedition has been, um, you know, a matter of debate and a matter of interpretation for scholars and historians for a long time and continues to be so. Um, I spent I spent some time uh, looking at and, and kind of surveying what others have had to say mm. uh, about whether this thing was a success or failure. Um, and 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 you get both sides of the coin. I mean, some look at it as a, as a dismal failure; others look at it as a success. Um, what I ha- what I determined is that, um, and I'm not completely alone in this. Uh, others have recognized it too. It's very difficult to determine the success or failure of this particular operation uh, because its objectives from the get go. Uh, in 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 March of 1916, its objectives were muddled from the beginning. Mm. Uh, what we see is there is a um, there is a, a a mixed and and kind of disjointed uh, bag of of mm-hmm. strategic objectives going into this thing, starting with the Wilson administration, um, right on down to, to to Pershing himself. And, you know, to make kind of a long story short, and I spend uh, quite a bit of time talking about this, is that, yeah, there are discrepancies as the orders come down the chain of command and and they range. Um, you, you know, it, it's interesting because you, you've, you've already touched on them in, in, uh, in, in a way. Um, capturing Villa um, mm-hmm. seems to be... Um, an objective that is kicked around uh, in in March of 1916. Um, But you also see um, just simply driving these forces away from the border. Right. As as an objective, Um, you know, which is different, right? I mean, you know, to capture an individual who is considered to be a troublemaker is Mm -hmm. one thing, but to just um, drive his forces away from the border is another. Uh, we also see um, securing the border as an objective. Mm. You know, making a situation where a raid such as V is is not going to happen again. Mm. So this makes it difficult to determine. Now, Via was not captured. Um, you know, he he manages to. Um, he manages to um, to give uh, Pershing the slip, but he also manages to give Carranza's forces the slip. So you know, Villa is uh, is not captured by 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 the Americans, but Villa is not captured by the Mexican army either. Um, and 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 I and I spend some time. In my conclusion, talking about, you know, kind of looking at this punitive expedition in a lot of ways as like an anti-insurgent operation, mm. to use a more contemporary term. Right. And I think that, that that it's an interesting way to look at this, especially in light of 
you know, recent U.S. military history and, and our global war on, on terror and Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, that, you know, anti-insurgent operations have uh, become, you know, a, a big component of what American armed forces are doing around the world in the 21st century. And I think when you look back at this punitive expedition in 1960, it, more, it looks more like an anti-insurgent operation than anything else where U.S. forces um, go into a, a foreign nation, a host nation, if right. you want to call it that, and, um, and, and are there to, to, to hunt down uh, an insurgent force that is not necessarily affiliated with the government or military of the host nation. And, um, you know, if we look at it that way, it, it brings out some interesting things because mm. in a lot of ways, puni Pershing's punitive expedition faced uh, back in 1916, a lot of the similar complications that anti-insurgent operations face in the 21st century. And, and one of them was, you know, one of the things that, that, that you mentioned that, yeah, I mean, the host nation um, is is giving a foreign military, in this case, the United States Army, permission to launch an expedition into their country, but to work within certain parameters. Right. And, and the Mexican government, you know, Carranza's government, did uh, give very specific parameters for Pershing's force uh, that they were supposed to um, restrict their movements to just Chihuahua in northern Mexico, and they were not supposed to venture any further south into Mexico than that. Mm. Um, eventually, um, Carranza's government decided that they really didn't want U.S. forces poking around in northern Mexico anymore. And sure enough, you know, Carranza sends the Mexican army into northern Mexico to launch a simultaneous um, operation to capture Villa. And that's when things get, you know, dicey to say the least. Um, there's a period of time where there are U.S. forces and Mexican regular forces searching for Villa. Right. And as you know, as as you could probably imagine, yeah, there were several episodes where U.S. forces and Mexican forces um, exchanged fire with one another. And mm. uh, it actually led to um, one of what we could kind of call a pitched battle in this whole thing. Um, you know, as you can imagine, um, there really wasn't much in the way of, of, of set piece battles in the punitive expedition. They were usually small skirmishes and pursuits and things like this. Uh, but there was one, uh, one episode um, that, that, that did very much look like a, a, a pitch. It was uh, short lived. But nevertheless, uh, you know, it involved U.S. forces launching an assault against entrenched Mexican forces. Um, and yeah, that happened not between Pershing's forces and Villa's forces. That happened between Pershing's forces mm -hmm. and the Mexican army. And, 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 and of course, it was after that clash that the United States government um, really placed heavy restrictions on Pershing's movements in Mexico. And, uh, and, and, and I think rightly so, because um, we were heading into a, into a bad direction with Mexico after, after that, and uh, potentially a war with Mexico. Dang, and, that is crazy. Yeah, and so for the last um, the last several months of the punitive expedition into Mexico, there really wasn't much going on at all. I mean, U.S. forces were still in northern Mexico, but they were no longer actively looking for Villa um, because they were essentially on guard uh, 
to see how the diplomatic situation between the United States and Mexico would go. Eventually, cooler heads prevailed. In February of 1917, President Wilson called all U U.S. forces out of Mexico, and the punitive expedition came to an end. And then, of course, within a few months, we in the third war in Imperial Germany, and we had um, priorities elsewhere at that point. But yeah, I think that the, the complications of launching an anti-insurgent operation uh, in a foreign country, and uh, they all came uh, they all came to the surface during this uh, situation in 1916. You know, much in the same way that they do today, uh, when you know um, we were in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. That is actually really interesting, and you know what it does reevaluate the history of the punitive expedition as as the first ever u.s insurgent operation of you know u.s forces in a host country operating uh following orders no matter how convoluted they may be uh what their objectives are and it is very fascinating to really explore you know this period because at the end we know that Pancho Villa does uh, die. I forgot how, but after his death, sort of the forces, his forces in Chihuahua, Mexico kind of just dwindle away. And I believe it was around the same time or maybe later Zapata in the southern states of Mexico, he also uh, passes away from and attacked by another faction that wanted him gone. But ultimately, the turmoil in Mexico at this time doesn't really cool down. Well, it does cool down in the sense that, you know, there's no revolutionaries yet. But, of course, that leads to another conflict, which the U.S. does get involved once more, which is the uh, Cruceos War, which that is another war um, in Mexico that not a lot of people... Um, know about, but if you've seen the movie uh, For Greater Glory with Andy Garcia, that is a war that, that is the war that is mentioned, so still on topic of movies, I guess it leads to another discussion of representation in media, which this gets very little here in the United States. I think the only mention of, you know, Pancho Villa and you know, his battles with the federal government during the Civil War, as well as with the U.S., the one that comes to mind is Marlon Brando's in the 1970s. So th that movie has probably taken a lot of liberties with the portrayal of Pancho Villa, but it does bring up the discussion of, you know, why isn't there a lot of scholarship in media about this? And from your research, uh, Jeffrey, do you think that this should be represented, you know, factually and historically correct, as opposed to how other scholarship have portrayed the 1916 punitive expedition into Mexico by the U.S.? Yeah, I, I, I think I think it's, it's certainly um, worth um, deeper exploration nowadays in the 21st century, uh, primarily for two reasons. Uh, one is just how much it was uh, akin to the anti-insurgent type of operations that we see around the world today, which mm -hmm. you and I you know, already spoke about. And I think that that is certainly one very good reason why, yeah, this is a uh, this is a topic that's worth um, taking a second look at nowadays. Yeah, uh, the other the other relevance to where we are today in the 21st century is um, I, I I think that um, as the subtitle of of my book implies that this is. Um, this is an important episode that is um, unfortunately consistent with the violent legacy of the U.S.-Mexican border that mm -hmm. we see today. 
And um, yeah, I think uh, what what you alluded to is 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 one hundred percent true. Is that you know when you look at the entire scope of the history of the U.S. Mexican border, you know from the eighteen thirties and forties right up until today. Yes. You see that, you know, violence uh, has been a characteristic of, of, of that border for, for, for a, a very long time. Uh, the, the punitive expedition into Mexico in 1916 um, is not the first, uh, not by a long shot, and not the last either. No. Um, you know, we can obviously go back to the Mexican-American War in the 1840s. Um, we, can, we can look at border disputes that continued between the United States and Mexico um, into the early 20th century. Uh, you know, it's interesting that you know, the Mexican-American War, we, we think of the Mexican-American War as the war that kind of settled the border between the United States and Mexico. And I guess that's partially true, but there also was a, there was a continued Disputes between the two countries um, over uh, the Rio Grande River, mm -hmm. uh, the Colorado River, um, the, the Baja Peninsula. Yes. Uh, the, the border disputes were, were not entirely uh, laid to rest by the Mexican-American War. Um, then, of course, you, you come into the early 20th century and the, the, the unrest that existed in Mexico and how that spilled over into the U.S. border, and it spilled over more than once. That the, the, the 1916 episode is probably the most high-profile episode, but during, you know, Mexico's civil war that, you know, went from 1910 and continued on into the 1920s, um, there were several occasions where violence um, came across the border, uh, even a couple of episodes where, you um, you know, kind of, um, I guess, guerrilla forces from the United yes. States invaded parts of Mexico with different plans on um, exerting their influence over different areas. Um, and then, of course, in more recent times, I mean, you know, we, we have the height of the, 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 the war on drugs in the 80s and 90s, which brought all kinds of violence to the mm -hmm. border. Uh, and, and of course, now more recently with, um, you know, the migrant situation and how that's created lots of tension and violence as well. And so I think this makes, uh, this is yet another reason why, yeah, looking, uh, taking a deep dive into this topic from back in 1916 is, is still quite relevant and, and, and uh, today because it, it shows us that uh, this is a legacy of tension and, and violence, which um, is uh, nothing new. Definitely. And it also kind of pairs with another guest who I had last month, Professor Romine, whose work is more on, you know, the medical history and public health between the U.S. and Mexico from the Mexican-American War and to the 1930s. And her topic was about, you know, how U.S. public health created, of course, you know, the facilities on the border for when um, Mexican migrants were entering the U.S. They went to these facilities to, as she found in her research, to clean, to make them, you know, sanitary. Because, you know, at the time, the U.S.'s policy was that the People from Mexico were disease-ridden and filthy carriers of disease. And I wouldn't be surprised if the punitive expedition ties into this larger narrative of defending the border and, you know, really hammering down on it. But you're right. It absolutely is true. Like, this is part of a larger discussion of the, the border discussion, the legacy of the U.S.-Mexican border. And you're absolutely right because before the war uh, in 1840s, you know, the idea of like, you know, this is the U.S. and this is Mexico, it wasn't really defined and outlined. Not until much later into, you know, after the punitive expedition and into the 20s and the 30s. So ultimately, you're absolutely right, Professor 
that this topic will probably be continuous in the United States and in the U.S. relations with Mexico, which ultimately leaves as almost like a little final uh, ending to this really, really important, very fascinating discussion, which is, I like to say, a what if. And I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this what if based upon your research. So, if Pancho Villa had been successful, or if the U.S. had been successful in their objective, let's say their main objective was through communications and getting actual official written orders, capturing Pancho Villa, or Pancho Villa sitting on the sidelines and letting the U.S. and Mexican forces kind of have their skirmishes, how different, in brief words, would the U.S. relations, U.S.-Mexican relations be in those two what-if scenarios? Well, that's a great question. And, 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 and I, I think that, um, I think, unfortunately, I, I don't think it would have done much. Mm, okay. Uh, I, I think if we somehow um, take the punitive expedition of 1916, um, even completely out of the equation. Um, I, I'm not so sure that it has much of a, uh, uh, an impact on the overall relationship. Really? And, and the border. Um, number one, because with or without the punitive expedition, you still have U.S. Um, investment um, in, 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 in northern Mexico at the time and and you with or without the punitive expedition um it's very likely that those american owned business assets in northern mexico um would have come under some other threat even if it wasn't via it 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 may have been some other um, right quasi military threat as uh, as a as a as a product of the civil war that was going on in Mexico at, at the time. And, and so for that reason, I think it, it, it probably was going to um, something similar to the punitive expedition was mm. probably happened one way or another. I mean, in fact, you know, even later on, there were a couple of U.S. military operations into Mexico to kind of um, one that happened um, uh, near Juarez. Um, so, yeah, we even have a couple of episodes that probably would have happened in and of themselves with or without the punitive expedition. Mm. Um, in terms of uh, VIA, I, I think, and I do explore this a little bit in, in my conclusion, I think if we, especially if we look at this thing as an anti-insurgent operation, I, I think uh, I think Via came out a winner, um, only because um, he was able to weather the storm, you know, for uh, for for almost um, uh, an entire year. He had two um, conventional military forces, one from the United States, the other from. Carranza's government uh, looking for him, chasing him down in northern Mexico. And right. He managed to evade both and survive. Um, after 1916, he actually rebuilds uh, his fighting force and, and, and will go on to continue to cause, you know, pretty significant military problems for Carranza for the next several years. Um, so I think in a way, um, VIA was successful. Uh, again, especially if you look at this thing as an anti insurgent mm. operation. Um, yeah, he survived. And, and not only did he survive, but he did exactly what he had been trying to do. He, he, he rebuilt his fighting force. Um, the fact that he had successfully evaded the Americans was uh, great for his uh, public image mm -hmm. and to boost um, recruitment for his forces 
And sure enough, um, he was uh, he found himself back in command of a relatively sizable fighting force, and like I said, continued to uh, to to cause some pretty significant problems for Carranza in the following years. But you are right. I mean, ultimately, um, he kind of uh, uh, settled in uh, and kind of moved away from right um, his life as a revolutionary. <laughs> And yeah, well, uh, later in life, he was eventually assassinated. Fascinating. And this is why I love this series, Years and Lists, because you learn so much about history and the kind of lost tales of history that don't get a lot of scholarship, which is unfortunate, but sometimes it's sadly true. And with that, we will end today's incredible discussion. I want to give a huge thank you to Professor... Uh, Lamanika for coming back on the show and telling us all about his book. And speaking of the book, Professor, where can people go and purchase a copy to read more about it? Well, I, um, I'll provide you uh, with with a link, um, and 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 you can uh, post it in the comments. Um, it can be purchased uh, through the publisher, uh, Melon Press. Excellent. I will link that down below in the description of this video. Make sure to check out Professor La Monica's interview right here to learn a little bit more. And there is the copy of the book. Again, I will link it down below in the description of this video. And if you also want to know a little bit more about U.S.-Mexican relations in terms of public health, I will also link Professor Romine's uh, Historian's Lounge episode right here. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us for the month of November for the Historian's Lounge. I'm so excited. I cannot wait to share with you all what I have lined up for December. So stay tuned for all the updates on my newsletter. And one last thing before I forget, Professor, where can people find you on the social media or the interwebs if they want to reach out? Um, I have a presence, uh, pretty active presence on LinkedIn. All right, I will link that down below as well in the description of this video, or you can go to Professor Lomonica's interview, which also has the link there. As always, this is The Wandering Scribe and The Wandering Quill signing out. Wish you all a wonderful day, evening, afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and make sure to like, comment, and subscribe down below.